Louis Farou has made a career out of the weird. But who's been telling you for 10 or 15 years you're an ugly bastard? His documentaries delving into the eccentric and marginalised figures of society have made him somewhat of a cultural figure. But is Louis Farouk simply a character created to disarm his subjects and lull them into a false sense of security? Is Louis Farouk for real? Louis Farouk thinks he has cutesy little endearing qualities that will make him rich. Feigned humility, self-effacing naivete on camera, innocent sounding questions, wide-eyed enthusiasm and pretended befuddlement. All gimmickry a shrewd satanic manipulator for sin. That's good stuff. I mean, he kind of nails it. I didn't think he was paying that much attention to me. If Louis Farouk is just a character, he could have well been lifted from the pages of one of his father's books, Paul Farouk, a prolific novelist and travel writer. Some of his works of fiction have been adapted into feature films, most notably The Mosquito Coast, which was adapted in the 1986 movie featuring Harrison Ford. Born in Medford, Massachusetts in 1941, Poole started his career as a teacher in Malawi for the Peace Corps in 1963. He left the United States as he felt it had to escape the confines of Massachusetts and a hostile US foreign policy. He was a keen traveller and it was when he was teaching in Uganda that he met Anne Castle, a British graduate student who would go on to produce for the BBC World Service. She was also teaching via voluntary service overseas. They married in 1967, with Anne giving birth to their first son, Marcel, soon after. But at a time of unrest in Uganda, which resulted in an angry mob of demonstrators threatening to overturn the car in which Anne was riding, resulting in the couple moving to Singapore in 1968. This was where their second son, Louis, was born, in 1970. Louis's parents moved the family to England when he was just one years old. He grew up in considerable wealth due to his father's successful literary career, attending the prestigious Westminster School, located within the precincts of Westminster Abbey. Apparently you asked to go to boarding school, why? Well, I think it was assumed because my brother had asked, and um, I asked him about this recently because we only lived about a half-hour cycle ride from Westminster where we went, and um, I don't know for sure, but I think it was partly due to us reading books by Enid Blyton. We started with the St. Clair's books and then we moved on to the Mallory Towers books. And it's a bit embarrassing to, to admit this because I don't think they're written... Maybe I shouldn't say this. I don't think they're written for boys, certainly as a boy. How would you describe them for anybody who hasn't okay, read them? OK, so they are a bit like Harry Potter, but with no magic. So they're all set at girls' boarding schools, and they're about girls having midnight feasts, and sometimes they, they start pranks. Always there's an episode where a girl swims too far out to sea and nearly drowns. And I think based on that, we thought, well, maybe that's what boarding school's like, endless midnight feasts and, and French teachers. I mean, was it? I know that you said San Quentin Prison reminded you of Westminster. It did a bit, yeah. Well, there's something about a, a, a lot of males, be they, you know, boys or men, in a confined space, something about the improvised physical fabric, which is all higgledy-piggledy. And then, I hesitate to say this, a certain level of situational homosexuality, which I think, I hope I'm not scandalising anyone, is relatively common Definitely in prison and to an extent in all male boarding schools. I mean, I could go on. There's quite a lot of other similarities. Cliqueishness and a sort of Darwinian atmosphere. But you don't go around stabbing people at Westminster. Two of Louis's closest friends at school were Adam Buxton and Joe Cornish, who he's still close friends with today. Both Adam and Joe went on to have careers on TV and radio. Louis credits their lively personalities with bringing him out of his shell more. They had often filmed skits and dances with Louis on their video camera in the early 90s. Satisfaction when we're done. Satisfaction. 
Another classmate of note was former Liberal Democrat leader and Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg whom Louis claimed he fagged for, which is a now-defunct system in British private schools where younger boys were forced to act as servants to the older ones. Doing such things is waking them up and bringing them a newspaper. Despite this odd predicament, the pair would grow to be friends and went on a road trip across America together in their late teens. During his school years, Louis was a bit of a rebel, delighting in pushing the boundaries and testing the patience of his teachers. Yet beneath this mischievous, rebellious exterior lay an eager student striving to excel in all his studies. This seemed to be a curious paradox with an underlying anxiety in young Louis. If, if exams were coming up, I'd get super anxious. And, um, and I don't mean to pathologise it. Like, I've never been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. I'm just slightly worry-prone. And as it happens, I've become less worry-prone as I've grown up. And it may be that there were other things going on you know, in my family life, who knows? Um, in, in, you know, my parents' marriage wasn't always happy. They subsequently divorced. There were other things that probably were going on that were stressful. But for whatever reason, I found that all without, almost without meaning to, I, I, would, I took my studies uh, very seriously. I have to sort of slightly check myself when I say this, because I do, I'm also aware that <laughs> I've looked back at some of my reports having kind of got quite attached to this narrative of myself as sort of super swat, right, super studious. And <clears throat> I've looked at some of my old report cards and some of them are, are especially when I'm six or seven, sort of say, um, you know, Louis is a pleasure to have in class, but I, it, sometimes it would be nice if he would let other pupils speak. He, he, he enjoys the sound of his own voice kind of thing. So I, I, I had a sort of rambunctious side and... It, almost in social settings, my mum tells a story, it's actually in my book, but of, of how when I was about five or six, I would come home and I'd be really sad. I'd be like, I don't know, I don't think I don't like school anymore. And she'd sort of think, well, Louis's obviously not getting on well at school. I need to talk to his teacher. And she went into to class and um, and talked to the teachers and said, do you understand Louis's very sensitive? He's a very sensitive young man. As I said, I would have been maybe five or six, seven years old. And the teachers were like, really? Yes, he's a very sensitive, like, just be mindful that, you know, things you can say might hurt his feelings, something like that. And they were like struggling to recognise her description of me. And then on the way out of class, she passed the classroom and could see through one of the glass windows in the door. And I was running along the desktops or doing a <laughs> dance on top of a desk. In other words, like, it was almost like in the setting itself, I was a wild child and, and she was just running amok. But also, I had like this doubling. Like, uh, and then I go home and be kind of be, be worrying about small, which I think is probably still true of me in some ways. That I have a, um, I have that sort of disruptive trickster impulse alongside a certain, um, a certain sensitivity. Louis's brother Marcel also attended Westminster at the same time, where his academic abilities gave him the edge over his peers. This left Louis feeling slightly inferior and likely contributed greatly to his anxiety as a child, as sibling rivalry spurred them both on in their studies. Marcel went on to become a respected filmmaker and novelist in his own right. Last summer, I was approached to go and find out about climate change. They didn't want an expert. They wanted to see what someone like me, who didn't know much about it, would make of the whole thing. Louis had long felt that his parents had taken a hands-off approach to his upbringing, given he had been sent to boarding school. He complained that the contradictory instructions of what they expected of him only added to the lack of emotional involvement, and that he rarely got to spend time with them at home. My parents, w I would say, um, like I respected them, I would have, I, I see how my kids behave towards me, and I'm that classic thing of like, God, if I did that to my parents... <laughs> that would not have gone well. It's not that I think of them being especially strict. I didn't feel they were at the time, but I wouldn't have dared to... Um, uh, uh, there, were, there was a sense of, of, of them having bound, boundaries that I would respect and observe. What I mean, they, 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 they slight, also, they slightly cheated because we went to boarding school, me and my brother, age 13. So those difficult teenage years of sort of 13 to 18 or 13 to 17... They were part-timing it. And if mum and dad, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but that's what it is, right? They, I mean, it was weekly boarding and they got me in the holidays. But other than that, they were getting me half of Saturday and Sunday. So I've got kids who are teenagers and 
you know that that's where like the, the, the a lot of the conflict kicks in. So uh, when I look back at how I related to my parents, there were there were times when um, it felt like they didn't get me, or they were being too hard on me, or the mixed messages because they were sort of on one hand being free spirited and saying like, if you want to smoke some spliff. Louis, like, that's fine. Just be careful you don't get caught, like, kind of thing. Or other times you'd be like, how dare you? You're going out there. Uh, you know, what What are you doing? Like, it was like, well, which part of the... Are we being... Are you being countercultural kind of dudes or are you going to be, like, Victorian parents? Like, which is it? The marriage of Louis's parents was far from a peaceful one. With his father having two extramarital affairs, matters not helped by his later decision to write a novel about the events, which would be titled My Secret History. His characters were based largely on himself and his wife, no doubt made worse by the truth being laid bare for all to see. Louis' mother herself would write about her experience in her memoirs titled The Year of the End, about feeling hurt due to the character Jenny in the novel being based on her saying, Although there were things about the character on which I liked and accepted, Jenny Parent had other qualities which I hated. She was shrewish and humourless, the portrayal diminished me. The book cruelly teased me with answers which may or may not have been fictional. The marriage would end in 1993 after many years of turmoil. After Westminster School, Louis went on to read modern history at Magdalen College in Oxford, graduating with first-class honours in 1991. After achieving what he set out to do at Oxford, Louis was left feeling slightly confused as what to do next. Until then I'd been like a greyhound, racing around a track, chasing the furry object, whatever it is, knowing sort of what I was supposed to do. And then suddenly it's like, right, you're off the track now. And you just don't know. I didn't know what to do. So for lack of other options, I went to America. I had a US passport through my dad. And I'd done a bit of student journalism at Oxford. So I ended up on a local paper in San Jose. I more or less stuck a pin in a map and sort of went there. And then that led to a job on a magazine in New York And then some friends said that Michael Moore, the documentary maker, was starting a new TV show co-funded by the BBC and he was looking for a British correspondent and I should come along and have a chat. And although I was completely unqualified and would never have seen myself as someone who could do that, I think that's what he quite liked. I think that the level of incompetence that I brought to the job was for him (laughs) a big plus. On TV Nation, Louis provided segments on offbeat cultural subjects, including selling Avon to women in the Amazon rainforest and attempts by the Ku Klux Klan to rebrand itself as a civil rights group for white people. This is one of the Klan figurines that we sell. Hand-painted. Hand-painted, and they will take orders. Premium Klan craftsmanship. Yes, sir. And it's craftsmanship with a capital K. With a K. Now, why is he sticking his arm in the air like that? It is a salute. You know, a lot of times the media will, they'll think that it's a Nazi salute. Okay, but I'm not... It does, it looks a little bit like a Nazi salute. Yes, but it is a right hand salute. Like the Roman Empire, they gave the right hand salute to legions. But that's his left hand. They made it wrong. <laughs> When TV Nation ended, Louis signed a deal with the BBC where he developed Louis Farouk's Weird Weekends in 1998, which was a longer-form continuation of his TV Nation segments. Ow! My teeth! I've seen you wiggle wiggle, for sure. I love being fussed over, this is my favourite thing. Damn! Nine! Somebody to love. Six sexy things. Don't move like that because I'll get the wrong idea. You're freaking me out. Louis's naive questions, childlike sense of wonder and perpetual confusion in the unusual social settings he encountered made the documentary series unique from anything else that was on television at the time. But Louis's approach was inspired by the BBC series In at the Deep End, which ran from 1982 to 1986 in the UK. Idiots have curly hair. (laughs) (laughs) You want to come in there with curly hair, doing this with the eyes? What, doing the whole gambit so auntie can see you? Then smile, you're a villain. 
Well, in just a few minutes' time, I shall be taking part in the RAC Rally, one of the world's most grueling motorsport events. I'll be sharing a car with the driver who's already won the event twice, Roger Clark. It was called In at the Deep End, and it followed a couple of presenters as they attempted to do unlikely professions, like they'd learn how to be a stand-up comedian, and it would build to them sort of tr trying out in their job, and usually failing in a sort of comic fashion. And what, what I added, I suppose, was to the idea of applying that to morally complicated stories, stories that were um, in some way either slightly dangerous or, 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 or with sort of some real moral questions, moral dubiousness about them. But this light-hearted approach by Louis is more calculated than meets the eye. When linguistic and body language experts examined Louis's interviewing style, they concluded that Louis's lack of social skills have helped him in his job. James Beatty, professor of psychology at Edge Hill University, said the problem with other interviews is that their face will change and influence what their subjects are saying when they're talking about something revealing. But it doesn't happen with Faroo. There's very little revealed and he's mostly blank. He's not giving any look of disapproval even if he doesn't agree with what's being said. He's very controlled and lets his subjects talk without judgment. They also make note of Louis's physicality while interviewing. Despite usually being taller than his subjects, Louis takes up very little personal space, tending to slightly hunch a little. Professor Beatty also notes how little you Professor Beatty also notes how little Louis uses his hands. He said, "Take your hands for example. It varies how you measure it, but 40% of our communication is done with our hands. But Louis hardly uses his." Can I, I look at it. your penis? <laughs> no. And if he does, it's normally directed away from someone's personal space. This encourages his subjects to feel like the dominant conversationalist. <laughs> Please. No. They feel so unthreatened that they'll express themselves not only verbally but with their hands too, putting the subject in control of the conversation. Nice helmet. Thanks. What does it say? A lot of stuff. Want a bone? <laughs> In the year 2000, Louis would make his next documentary series titled When Louis Met, where he would interview celebrities whose best years were behind them. Louis would use the same techniques to get the former stars to drop the facade and reveal more of their true selves, but this technique was not easily employed on Jimmy Savile. Ask me what they are. No, 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 no. You see, a good interviewer always yeah. asks questions he never opinionates yeah. before the answer, because the answer might make him look a bit silly. Yeah. Louis' programme on Jimmy Savile has somewhat come to define Louis' career. After Jimmy Savile died in 2011 and the hundreds of allegations against him of sexual abuse of which largely involved children came out, many went back with the benefit of hindsight to view Louis' interview with Savile, with many feeling that Louis didn't push Savile hard enough with questions about the rumours of sexual misconduct which circulated around Savile for a lot of his career. Yeah, yeah. From yeah. himself. It's not all going to, it can't all be positive though, can it? I mean, that's just not reality. No, it's all right. They make it as negative as they like. That's all right. See you in court. <laughs> Jimmy Savile was known to be obstructive when being interviewed, constantly interjecting with quips to take control of the conversation. Would that woman... Work out, work out some, uh, instead of negative things, which keep cropping up, Try and work out two or three things that I can give you a piece of wisdom. Might just be a bit of help for somebody. Mm. All right, then? You know, a lot of people on the way up, for instance, mm. that want to be, you know, uh, uh, what's it like for somebody today to get in the business or something mm. like that. So when Louis did try to get straight answers out of Jimmy, he ended up getting frustrated with Savile's behaviour. This was the first time Louis had encountered an interviewee who wouldn't play ball. And truth be told, I was finding him slightly irritating. I felt he was using his patter to deflect my questions. Despite their difficult interaction on camera, the pair would strike up a friendship with Savile agreeing to do promotion with Louis for the When Louis Met DVD. When the Jimmy Savile, the first documentary I made about Jimmy Savile, when he was alive, when Louis met Jimmy, I remember when we promoted it, um, before, I think it was when we promoted it, and he, he agreed to do an interview to promote it. And he, part of that was a profile interview in the Guardian, and he was interviewed at the at King's Cross in one of the in the hotel there, in one of the hotel rooms. And the guy from the Guardian came down. I don't even know why it came up, um, but I made a joke, and he said, "Ah, insincerity, your speciality." 
That comment of Jimmy Savile stuck with Louis, as it wasn't the first time someone had questioned his authenticity. Not only had his first wife said something similar, saying, there's nothing real about Louis. This seemed to be a side to Louis's personality which he struggled with in his personal relationships. With his friends joking that he sometimes seems aloof and robotic. In fact, you were on Gogglebox, I think they showed a clip. Right, I heard that. And um, everyone said, oh, he's nice, isn't he? Oh, he's being really sensitive, as if normally you're not. Maybe you can shed light on that. Well, I guess you've got you've got a kind of a, a quality of aloofness, of detachment sometimes, which you need to have in order to be sort of semi-objective in in making the films that you make, right? It, to me, it doesn't equal emotional aloofness. I don't. But you know what? Like, a, why is there water coming from your eyes? Sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, robot man. You are involved in this strange cult. I will not judge you, but I am curious <laughs> to see where you are. Where are you going to now? Who was that man you were speaking to? <laughs> there is, I mean, that's a stupid way of characterizing what you do, but I feel like some people think of you that way. Like, um, like me and Joe always used to say, that pick up on this thing that you would sometimes do. You would hear people describing something usually something odd that they did in their lives. This is me in real life or on television? No, on TV. Yeah. So they would say something weird and you would go, meaning? Meaning, yes, meaning. In order to get them to e- yeah. E- expand. Yeah. Um, but me and Joe always used to say, meaning, because it sounded, that was robotic. Robot, yes. There appears to be many facets of Louis's personality which even those closest to him can't quite decipher with Louis finding it hard to find the right balance between his home life and work. I've, I experience, like, a lot of the times my work is, is a licence to be intimate without consequences. You talk to people, someone in a prison, you know, who's been sentenced to 10 life sentences, he's like, OK, how does that feel? So what is, what's life like? And, and then <clears throat> kind of get, getting, or whatever happens to me, all the work I've done in some sense is about attempting to peel layers back and, and, and see inside someone's psyche and then get on a plane and fly off and go home and live my normal life almost at a, a less intimate plane of existence. You know, and the other joke I've made over the years is like, oh, what makes me good at my job is also what makes me bad at life. Towards the end of the 2000s, Louis moved on to more serious subjects, adopting a more earnest personality on camera one of which includes a follow-up documentary after Jimmy Savile's death. Louis had doubts about his own journalism and reflected that Jimmy must have thought he'd found an easy target with Louis, believing he could manipulate him and wouldn't be pressed on rumours about his private life. Do you want to say why it was that it was so important for you to go back to to the Savile subject? Uh, I don't know how thought through it was in in one level. I was just aware that uh, I had had this rather bizarre situation in which a a profile that I'd made of an eccentric aging celebrity who appeared to have secrets but undefined um, secrets had become uh, the most in-depth TV portrait of Britain's most notorious sex offender, you know, um, 15 years, I suppose, after I'd made it. I'm very torn on this because on one level, I'm really proud of the original show, and I feel it showed more than anyone else had while he, he was alive. On another level, I'm aware that we missed this vast secret that he had. And a little part of me feels disappointed with myself that, you know, that he, was, he, he agreed to do this documentary with me. At some level, he must have known that he had these secrets and that he saw me, he sized me up and thought, you know what, I can give this guy two weeks or three weeks of access and make a documentary about me, and I'm not too worried that he's going to uncover the fact that I'm a um, sexual predator. Despite the doubts Louis had about his journalism as a young man, whether it was genuine or created purposely, his personality brought the best out of his subjects. He managed to strike up friendly relationships with people from vastly different walks of life to his own. Nowadays, he has become a kind of elder statesman figure, being held in high regard by fans, critics and the public alike. His work as an investigative journalist has cemented his position as one of the greatest documentarians of our time. But the fact he is so revered means that his interviews and documentaries no longer require the same degree of digging as he had once had to do, as his subjects are more than willing to give up their thoughts and experiences for him. 
But despite all this, it's safe to say Louis' career has been a weird one. He's been a porn star extra, he attempted to interview Michael Jackson, he's been compared to Pontius Pilate, he's been a meme, and released a rap song. So, do you think Louis Farou is for real? Louis Louis? Oh, poor Louis Louis. Your, your vibe is very odd. My money doesn't jiggle jiggle, it folds. I want to see you wiggle wiggle, for sure. It makes me want to dribble dribble. You know, riding in my beard, you really have to see it.